Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. Today we're doing another Her Name Is episode. So if you're new to the channel, this is a series that is dedicated to gender-based violence victims in South Africa. We look at their stories and share how their lives are unfolded. Now today's video is dedicated to the beautiful Oyinene Mkhoikyana. Now as usual, please feel free to fact check me down in the comments below but I do try and make sure that I thoroughly check all the information before I proceed with any video so please remember to like comment and subscribe and let's begin this video Oyine Nemkhoyana was born on the 20th of April in 2000, which makes her an Aries. She was born to mother Noma Boto Mkhoyana and father Mabel Mkhoyana. She has an older brother named Eso Mkhoyana and they were a tight-knit family of four that live in the affluent neighborhood of Beacon Bay in Eastern Cape in East London. At the tender age of only four years old, her family said that Oyine asked to go to school and she was taken to Little Flower Preschool. She later moved to one of the best primary schools in the Eastern Cape, Hudson Park Primary School, where she completed her primary education. She excelled academically and she also chaired the Student Council in 2013. In the very same year, she was awarded the Hudson of the Year Award. In 2014, Uyinene would move from East London to a small town in the Eastern Cape named Grahamstown, where she would start her high school career. She started grade 8 in Kingswood College, where her friends and teachers described her as a person with the purest of intentions, and they had the biggest heart. She excelled academically throughout her high school career as well, but also allowed herself to have fun and fool around. People's person loved her friends, and this is how she was described by most of her friends in Kingswood. Oyinene matriculated in 2018 with excellent results and applied to study further at the University of Cape Town. She was accepted at UCT to study towards a BA degree in media studies. In January of 2019, Oyinene packed her bags and moved to Cape Town to start a new and exciting chapter of her life. She moved into a UCT off-campus residence called Ross Common House in the Claremont Main Road in Cape Town. Once settled in, like most first-year students do, she explored Cape Town and she was seen hiking the Chapman's Peak and enjoying the Cape Town summers in Camps Bay Beach. While doing all of this, it's very important to note that Uyinene took her academics seriously and her family has very proud has very proudly confirmed that she did very well in her gym exams and passed all her modules that she was taking in that semester. June holidays came and Uyinene went back home to East London to visit her friends and unfortunately this would be the very last time that Uyinene would go to East London. Upon returning back to Cape Town in July of 2019 to start her second semester at UCT, little did she know that in less than a month, her life would come to an unfair and horrible end. So I will go through the timeline of events that took place from this very moment on, and then I will read a statement by Luanda Borda, who is the perpetrator. So on the 8th of August of 2019, Uyinene went to the post office to inquire about a parcel she was waiting for. She had bought some clothing items overseas from an online shop. She was met by Uleanda Bota, who told her that her parcel had not arrived yet and he will keep an eye out for it and make sure to contact her as soon as the parcel comes in. On the 16th of August, the parcel arrived at the post office and Uliander Botta registered it the very same day. He did not contact Uyinene on this day. On the 24th of August, which is a Saturday, Botta contacts Uyinene to inform her that her parcel was available for collection and she must come. Now, before I continue, I want to take a moment and give you a brief background about Luanda Botta. Luanda Botta had been an employee of the South African Post Office since 2012, but was made permanent only in 2013. When he was made permanent in 2013, he declared that he had no criminal records and the South African Post Office did not evade him any further. Three years later, in 2016, when he was about to be promoted as a teller, he then declared again that he had no criminal records and the post office again did not vet him any further. 
2018, when the South African Post Office was going to start distributing SASA payment grants, only then did they now go through a screening process for all their employees. And they found out that 174 of their employees had criminal convictions, including Luanda. He was convicted for hijacking a car in 1998 and served five years in prison. After finding out this information, a year prior to Uyinene even meeting Luyanda, the South African Post Office failed to do anything about the 174 people that they hired that were dishonest about their convictions. And in my opinion, they did not only fail at protecting other employees that they had hired, but also clients walking into the South African Post Office on a daily basis to be served by convicted criminals. On the 24th of August 2019, when Luanda Bota contacted Oyinen Mkhoyana to come and collect her parcel, Oyinene took a taxi fire from a residence in Clermont and made her way to Clarenish Post Office to collect a parcel which she had been waiting for. She arrived after one and the door was opened for her. That would be the last time Oyinene would be seen. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read a statement by Luanda Botta. This is his confession, and he narrates everything that happened from that moment on. Luanda's statement is very graphic, and if you feel like you might be triggered by it, like I was when I first read the statement, I highly suggest that you skip this part of the video and move on to the next part. Um, it is triggering, it is graphic, and I'm going to try my best to read it with the utmost respect to not only Uyinen, but her family too. The statement reads, I, Luanda Bota, was employed as a teller at the Clarenash Post Office in Clermont. I interacted with the deceased on the 8th of August of 2019 when she entered the Clarenesh Post Office to inquire about a parcel she was expecting. The parcel contained clothing that she had purchased online. The parcel was not available and I told the deceased I would contact her to tell her when the parcel was available. The parcel arrived at the post office on the 16th of August of 2019. I registered the parcel on the same day. On Saturday, the 24th of August 2019, I reported for duty at Clarenesh Post Office. The post office was due to close at 1 at 1300 hours. Shortly before 1300 hours, my colleague Soraya Abdullah went home as per an agreement between us, leaving me alone in the post office. I contacted the deceased to inform her the parcel was available for collection. The deceased used a taxi fire taxi service to travel from her residence, Ross Common University student accommodation in Clermont to the Clarenage Post Office. She arrived at the post office after closing time. I locked the door and the deceased entered. When she entered the post office, we were alone in the locked post office. When the deceased searched her bag to pay the requisite custom fees, I started making sexual advances towards her. I proceeded to sexually touch the deceased against her will. I inserted my fingers into her vagina. I then inserted my penis into her vagina. The deceased fought whilst I tried to violate her. She managed to run to the door, but I caught up with her and I knocked her to the ground. I dragged the deceased to the safe inside the post office. I locked her up inside the safe. The deceased screamed while inside the safe. I choked the deceased and she fought back and kicked me. I took a 2 kg weight used to weigh the packages received at the post office and used it to bludgeon the deceased to death. I targeted her head. I left the post office and consumed alcohol outside a nearby Lika outlet. I returned to the post office shortly thereafter and I covered the body of the deceased with cushions, blanket and a jersey as she lay in the safe. I left the post office in the evening. I returned to the post office in the early hours of Sunday, the 25th of August of 2019. The area where I attacked the deceased and where her body lay was covered in blood of the deceased. I proceeded to clean up the inside of the post office to remove the blood from the scene. I waited until it was dark and requested the security officer who patrolled the outside of the perimeter of the post office to allow me to park my motor vehicle in the yard of the post office. 
Once parked in the yard, I placed the body of the deceased in a large postal bag and carried her body to the motor vehicle. I transported the body of the deceased to a field in Likukule to west and dumped it in a shallow hole. I then drove to a nearby petrol station and purchased petrol. I returned to where I disposed of the body of the deceased. I doused her with petrol and set her alight. I admit I did so to defeat or obstruct the course of justice by destroying forensic evidence. I admit I hired someone to clean my car to destroy forensic admit evidence. I admit the body of the deceased was discovered on Monday the 26th of August 2019. I admit that she was correctly identified as Uyine Nemkhwikyan. This man is pure evil, you guys. <laughs> As this was happening, Uyinene's friends and family were looking for her. The hashtag, bring Nene home. Hashtag, Uyinene. Hashtag, where is Nene? Hashtag, Nene was going viral in South Africa. Her family came down from East London to Cape Town, and they hired a private investigator to try and look for Uyinene. Friends from UCT and all around South Africa were sharing her images and posts on social media. Everyone in South Africa was looking for Uyinene. Night vigils were made all around South Africa, not only in UCT, but different varsities around South Africa all held night vigils, praying and hoping for Uyinene's return. On the 26th of August, a body was discovered like the perpetrator had stated in his statement, it was discovered in Kaya and an autopsy was made, and unfortunately, it was confirmed that the body was of Uyine Nemkhwikyan. As you can imagine, the country was left in despair, as we were all hoping that she would come back home. Her family, obviously traumatized. Her friends, traumatized. Each and every South African woman was shattered, Asking themselves, am I next? Kylie Cha residents rebelled against the perpetrator because now everyone had an idea of who did this. They burned down his house, which I myself personally, I supported because no way was he ever, 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 ever suitable to stay with other people or in a community of people and kids and children and women. So burning down his house, personally for me, was the best thing that they could have done. The country and the world mourned Uyine Nemkhwikyana's death. The president, Ramaphosa, he flew to East London to mourn with the family. Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Saxis, visited Uyine's murder site as a personal gesture and to show respect. On the 7th of September 2020, in Abbotsford Church in East London, in the Eastern Cape, Queen and his life was celebrated in a beautiful send-off by friends, family, and the rest of South Africa as her funeral was broadcasted live on television. Her brother made a painful yet beautiful tribute to her sister. Greetings to everyone gathered here. Before you today is Esona Kwekiana. We always owe the brother. I remember at some point, she used to try to reprimand me from calling her Uyu in front of her friends. Uh, because they all called her by another name, which everyone seems to have caught on to, which is Nene. I stand before you today deeply hurt, confused and grieving. This is a very difficult speech to make. On one hand, I want to share the memories that I had with my little sister and all the different dynamics to her and her personality. On the other hand, there has been a national outpouring of outrage over the treatment of women by men and the lack of significant changes in society in addressing this epidemic. But knowing Winene, I know she would have wanted me to say something, even if it took away from this moment. Her untimely passing has revealed to us the evil that exists in this world, evil that has been allowed to thrive, evil that she herself despised. I can't remember the last time we went out as a family and she didn't mention how the societal structures present today continue to oppress women in every shape and form. 
I would sometimes engage with her, make comments that she didn't agree with, and she would fight me on them. I would make comments that she did agree with, but she would later come back after having done her research and fight me again. She really had a strong fighting spirit. I mean, if I had the TV remote for longer than she thought was reasonable, we were going to have problems. She would make a point to wake up the next day earlier than me, get to the remote before I did, and have the TV to herself, just to fracture my masculinity for the day. Days like today really project to us that we are living in dark times, especially in South Africa, with no clear direction as to where we're heading. Yet in such times we can find comfort in the word of God. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Isaiah 41 verse 10 goes on to say, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the righteousness of my right hand. As I read these verses in the build up to all of this, while she was missing, I struggled and battled with a lot of questions and still do even now. Like where is God? Why did this happen to my sister? Why couldn't I be there to protect her? But if we were to understand God and the working of His ways, then He wouldn't be God. So although I have these questions, I pray one day that some of these answers might be revealed to me. Unene was very unique, genuine and honest. When it was time to compliment and celebrate others, she did. When it was time to be straightforward and frank, she was. I know for me, there are certain things that I'm afraid to confront my mother and father about. <coughs> but with her, even my father had to take a step back and be confronted by her. <laughs> And I would look on and think, this is above me now. In many ways, they share very similar characteristics. My mother and I are the quieter ones. So you can imagine her confronting me was light work for her. <laughs> I remember my dad likes to tell a story of when we were younger. Um, when my parents found out of something that she had done that she wasn't supposed to do. She assumed that I was the one that told my parents. So after being reprimanded by my parents, she goes back to the room and starts shouting at me. While she was busy shaking me back and forth. Bear in mind, I'm supposed to be the older brother here. Last time I spoke to her, she was telling me that she had plans she had made to celebrate the, my mother's birthday. She wanted us to go hiking. Okay, fine. Amongst other things, she wanted us to go wine tasting. <laughs> so I ask her, oi, oi, when have you ever seen our mother drinking alcohol? And she cheeky replies, at her big age, she has no excuse. <laughs> She had a big sense of humor and playfulness. I'm sure many of her friends can attest to that. She could dance and as much as she tried to teach me, it never worked out for me. <laughs> Unene was very artsy and enjoyed exploring things like music. She briefly played the piano and she excelled at playing the saxophone. She wasn't the greatest at sports, but she participated as much as she could and enjoyed being with her friends. She had taken up a whole new healthy lifestyle, going for a run every day, and taking no meat. She cooked me a meal once, and she said, I care. If it doesn't taste good, hide it, bro. <laughs> she refused to even taste the meal that she had made because of that meat. At home, I would get so anxious when I go to the kitchen to do normal people things like drink Coke, only to find a big jug of water with Amalgam inside. <laughs> I know I'm being unhealthy drinking acidic drinks, but she could have at least let me be unhealthy in peace. In closing, we were, I know we still had experiences to live through and memories to make together. 
I always pictured a future where I'd one day tell my children that I'm dropping them off at my sister's for the weekend. A future where we would one day grow old together and reflect on how far we had come. But I know you're in a better place where there's no sickness, no anxiety, and no stress, but pure joy and peace. The one thing I will hold on to is that to your very last breath, you were fighting. And I'm sorry that I wasn't there to fight for you. I'm so proud of you. Your fight is now our fight. Let them go to bed, guys. Oyinene was later laid to rest in her ancestral home in Tendane, a few kilometers outside of East London. Luyanda Borta did not have an actual trial because he decided to confess. He was found guilty of four counts, including two counts of rape, murder, and obstructing and defeating the ends of justice. He was sentenced to three life sentences and five years for the obstruction of justice. He will be eligible for parole after 25 years. Inene's family was actually advised that they could sue the post office because of the fact that they literally did nothing about the fact that they had a convicted person who had lied um, about his conviction. And uh, after finding out literally for a year, they did nothing to rectify that. So, but uh, the family has not sued yet and it's, obviously up to them, but personally I would, um, because this is such an upsetting case, you guys. So we have officially reached the end of the video. As usual, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Please comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.